All right, so let's do another example. And the goal of this one is to show you what to do when mutation goes wrong. So as a reminder, our question or framework uses mutation, it starts with a solution, it uses source level mutation to produce examples that it thinks should be incorrect. And, and then it tests those to make sure that they do test as incorrect. Now, sometimes that mutation produces examples that are actually correct. Right. So, so let me show you the simplest possible example of this. Um, and I think this is actually um, uh, identical to something that we already have in the question library, but I'll just, I'll just produce it very quickly here because this is a pretty easy uh, question to set up. Right? So I'll create my Java question called question. This is going to be a method-based question. Um, I'll say correct uh, name is equal to largest of or larger of two. Um, Oh, I've got to do my import here. Good uh, author is me. And the version is the first version in June 2011. Okay, great. Um, all right, so now we'll say, um, you know, int larger, uh, int first, int second. You can probably already see that this is going to go wrong. If first is greater than second, uh, return first, else return second. Okay. Um, and I have to uh, write a description of this, so I'll say uh, write a method larger that returns the larger of two int arguments. There we go. Okay, cool. Um, so, oh, why is it angry about this? Uh, yeah, okay, and some of these, it, it, you know, and this is actually a great example, right? So it's encouraging us to use math.max. How would a student answer this question, right? Like we'd probably ask this question in the first couple of weeks of, of you know, CS1. Uh, are they gonna think to use math.max? Probably not, right? So let's leave it this way. Um, the other thing that, that can be true, and this is also true with things like for loops, sometimes when you set up a for loop, it'll encourage you to use the enhanced for loop. Um, but sometimes you don't want to do that because the um, three-part for loop is actually easier to mutate, right? So, you know, there, there's cases where you don't want to take these suggestions that IntelliJ might be making, and, and we can disable this, right? So basically, if you go here, say more actions, uh, disable, suppress for class, and then, you know, it's going to uh, give me a chance to do the manual min-max calculation, which is exactly what I want to do. That's what this whole problem is about. So, so sometimes, you know, IntelliJ is very clever, and it's really awesome that we get to use it to write problems like this, because in general, it's very, very helpful. Um, but there's times when it wants you to do things that we don't want to do, right? So that's an easy way to, to suppress that warning. Okay, cool. Uh, let's focus this. Now, I probably still have uh, the previous one I did focus. Yeah, let's turn this guy off. Go back here, and we'll focus uh, this, and we'll now we'll test it. Um, now, keep in mind how mutation works, right? We're looking for places where we can make small changes. And anytime the mutation library sees that greater than, um, one of the things it's going to do, so one of the things it's going to do is going to invert the condition. It's going to try less than, right? But the other thing it's going to do is it's going to try greater than or equal to. Um, and this can cause problems, right? So um, let's go to our report, right? Which is uh, the, the validation failed. And again, you know, uh, you don't always have to look at the report if you have a failing, uh, val oh, this is the wrong report, sorry. Um, this is for the wrong thing. Sorry, we are doing largest of two. Here's the report. Uh, I don't know if we've looked at the report for a failed validation yet or not, but there is a report. You can also just look at the error message. They essentially contain pretty much the same information. Um, but here's what happened. Um, we created a mutation and that mutation worked, okay? And our test harness does not expect this to happen, right? So it thinks something's wrong here and it throws up its hands and refuses to validate the question. Now, if we look at the code, we can see what the problem is, right? So it mutated uh, and you know, we set up a nice explanation for you. So originally it was at first is greater than or second, equal, greater than second, and it mutated it to greater than or equal to second. But the problem is in the context of this question, they are both correct, all right? Um, and so there is some uh, information here about what to do. Sometimes the code is actually correct and we just haven't found an input that causes it to behave incorrectly, right? And so in that case, you might want to add something to fix parameters, right? So that's one of the suggestions here. 
The other suggestion is it says, if the code is a mutation that should pass, you may need to disable the mutation using mutate disable condition mill boundary. And let me show you how to do this, okay? Um, so we're gonna go back to our code, right? And at the place, at the line where, it's very important, right? So at the line where the mutation takes place, I'm gonna add a comment. And what this does is this tells our mutation library, don't perform this specific type of mutation at this specific location. There's also a way, if you just do mutate disable, it'll disable all mutations. That's not usually what you want to do. Usually you want to only disable like some. I would probably encourage you most of the time, try to disable them one at a time, right? Uh, don't just turn off everything because that's a little too dramatic, right? Uh, and, and you'll lose some good mutations that you actually want to keep. Okay, so let's try this again. Uh, if we run the test cases, right? And we'll see what happens. And now this should work. Um, and you'll see that it does in fact work. Um, so, you know, a uh, simple example of what happens. And, and there's, let, let me give you some other examples of when this might happen. This is actually one of the most common. Like when you're doing, there's certain times when you're doing a comparison and the greater than versus the greater than or equal to actually turn out to have identical semantics. So this is one of the more common mutation suppressions that I find myself using as I write problems. Here's some other examples. Sometimes you have an optimization, right? So like, uh, think about string rotation. That's one of our classic uh, problems, right? Given a string, rotate it a certain amount. Um, you might have a check at the top that says if the string is empty, just return an empty string, right? Well, think about, you know, so the idea is that the mutator might take that and think this is required for correctness and then just remove it. And it might turn out that the rest of your code still works completely fine with an empty string. There's just a loop that doesn't execute or something like that. So that's another example where you may need to keep it. That's okay to keep, right? Uh, in fact, it's, it's not a bad idea to, to, you know, you want to write it in the way that you want the student to write it. So identifying examples for uh, early return, right, for example, is fine, right? You don't need to remove those. But what you'll find is the mutator will complain because it'll say, I removed this whole block. That's one of the things it'll do, right? So for example, let's look at some of the, it's always fun to look at some of the things that the mutation engine actually tries, right? Uh, so now, let me move this over here. Um, yeah, so, and in this one we used six, right? Um, now, you know, sometimes mutation causes the code not to compile, right? So you'll see that in this case, uh, we use seven mutations. Um, one of the things we'll do is we'll re replace return statements, which was return zero, essentially. Um, this one we took the greater than and we negated it to less than or equal to, right? Um, in this one, we actually negated the whole if statement. Right? That actually turns out to have the same effect, but that's not always the case. Right? So we basically took the whole if conditional and we just put a, uh, put a not around the whole thing. Uh, and this is the primitive return in the second half of the if statement. Um, and in this case, we just toss the entire method. Now, one of the things that it will try to do is it'll actually try to remove branches of the if statement. Um, and in this case, uh, we can't, right? Because it's actually required for correctness, right? And so sometimes, there are certain mutations that will cause the code not to compile, right? The reason the code doesn't compile in these last two instances is that there's a return inside the if statement and the mutation engine isn't smart enough to see that. So when it returns one branch of the if, it actually means that there's a branch through the code that doesn't um, hit a return and so Java will complain about that. So anyway, just so you understand a little bit about what this is doing. Um, you know, as you start working with this tool, you know, feel free, as you start to write more complicated pieces of code, you'll find that the mutation uh, engine will generate lots and lots of mutations, right? Uh, and a lot of them are, are sort of interesting to look at. Um, so, so anyway, but you know, in cases where you look at the result and you're like, no, 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 this is right, right? The mutation ended up producing a piece of code that is actually correct, then you might want to suppress it. One of the things also to point out is that we never mutate code twice. We only ever apply one mutation. So we take the solution, we apply one mutation. We take the solution, we apply one mutation. We don't take the mutated code and apply another mutation. The problem is that if you apply two mutations, now there's a non-zero chance that you actually produce a correct solution, right? So for example, like I changed a plus plus to a minus minus, then I change it back to a plus plus. Or there might be two parts of the code that if I change both of them in a certain way, they counteract each other, right? And the code ends up being correct. So we only ever apply one mutation, right? We create multiple pieces of mutated code 
but we create each one by starting with the solution and applying a single mutation rather than starting with the solution and applying multiple mutations, right, to the same piece of code, if that makes sense. So, so you know, you will need to work around this. You know, I was looking in the code uh, that I've been working on, the problem database I've been working on, and there's, there's you know, I, I would say, I don't know, there's not a huge number, but it's not uncommon to have to use a mutation suppression as part of writing the solution. Um, but the testing harness will whole, sort of help guide you in the right direction there with some hints and some information about, about what to do. Um, so uh, good luck with that. If you need to apply to mutation suppression, you know, think carefully about uh, doing it, apply it very selectively, um, but it's not uncommon that you might have to do this once in a while when you're writing new questions.